You're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFR 100.5 FM. We're here on the unceded traditional territory of the Salish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. This is Bernadine Fox, here with my co-host for the week, Glenn Gregg, bringing you Both Sides Now. Welcome to our show. We are coming to you today from our collective homes, and as such, we have not gotten all of the technology down as of yet. So bear with us. Today, my co-host, Glenn Grigg, is going to work through some issues with us about how we are reacting to COVID-19. Glenn, for those of you who don't know, is the chair of FACT BC, a therapist in private practice and a consultant with the provincial government here in BC on creating a mental health response to COVID-19. Hi, Glenn. Hey, thanks for having me on. Great to, great to be here. Yeah, I hear you're really busy, so I really appreciate that you're here. While our governments are working to keep us able to stay in our homes, our mental health is collectively taking a hit. Um, in BC, we are just past the two-week mark for social isolation and distancing, and so everybody's getting a little and see and recognizing the ways in which that connections to the people in their lives have been important to them. And um, so, uh, so Glenn, I wanna ask you, what kinds of things are you beginning to see in your clientele and or the general population at this time? Well, I think uh, you're asking great questions because uh, the first priority that we have to give when we're responding to an epidemic uh, is we have to make sure that we're not making physical contact with each other because that's how viruses get around. So we have to do that. But it's also psychologically paradoxical because here we have an invisible enemy. Uh, there's something out there that's not just harmful, it's potentially deadly and you can't see it. That's the stuff of horror right. stories. That's the stuff of nightmares. And it's all around us and we can't see it. So what do we do? What are we wired up to do as human beings, as mammals, to calm ourselves down? We're group animals. And so when we get together, uh, we're safer. Uh, that means that there's more eyes looking around. We're getting that reassurance. Uh, we have people around us. There's strength in numbers. All those kinds of deeply natural, important things that we do to get reassurance when we're being told that there's danger around and when that danger is amped up by not being able to see it, those are exactly the things we're not allowed to do. So in terms of anxiety and anything that you're up against getting substantially, or at least potentially worse, this is kind of a perfect paradox, if not a perfect storm. I want to quickly go to Jake, who I chatted with a couple days ago. He is talking about an anxiety he's been noticing around COVID-19 and the social distancing he has been having to do. I suspect this is not an uncommon anxiety he is dealing with. Here is Jake in his own words. Hi, Bernie. It's good to be on the phone with you. I, um, I want to say, like, I probably don't sound like my normal self. I've been, uh, I've been sick. Uh, yeah for the last couple of weeks and I'm, I'm just on the road to recovery now. So everybody would uh, first question whether or not you're sick with COVID-19. Well, that is the $64,000 question, isn't it? I mean, who's getting tested out there? People that are really, really sick and going to the hospital are getting tested. But I mean, it's not like I can go to my doctor's office and say, can you test me, please? No. They won't test me. For a lot of us, we have no idea what's going on with our health vis-a-vis -vis COVID virus right now. No. I've had um, head cold and chest cold symptoms for two weeks. Um, when I listen to people on uh, TV or uh, people being interviewed that have got the COVID virus, what they describe they have, I have some symptoms of, but not nearly as severe as what they describe. So, um, but my thing is I'm, symptomatic and sneezing and coughing and uh, so 
I can't be around people because I know I'm spreading germs. Whether they're COVID or not almost doesn't matter um, right. as much. Only to me if my health takes a turn for the worse. But I've been plateauing for 14, 15, 16 days. It's not really gotten any better or worse over that period. Well, the fact that it hasn't gotten any worse is is a good sign, um, definitely. Yeah, Either so you have it and you're getting better, or you don't have it and you're getting better. So either way, it's a good thing. Um, you you talked a little bit um, about anxiety before. What does that anxiety feel like for you? Um, I don't know. Like it, it's affecting my sleep certainly. I just feel like I walk around um, carrying this, uh, I don't know, sense of, uh, like like I'm bouncing off the walls of my body on the inside. I'm like, I'm not able to really relax. I, I feel like I want to shut the news off and not watch it, but I can't not watch it because I need to know what's going on in the world. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm disconnected from uh socialization or civilization well and, you are and and besides talking to friends and yourself on the phone um the tv is really my only way to bring information into my my living space so i can absorb what's going on and and figure out what i need to do right but i'm i'm really like the anxiety manifests like i'm i'm bouncing off the walls inside myself and a I'm sleeping in fits like an hour here, two hours there. And, uh, do you get nightmares? I wouldn't say that I've had actually a couple of nightmares since I've been sick though. Like uh, I don't normally get them. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it wasn't like a nightmare nightmare. Like fr it was just weird. It was like yeah. a weird dream that maybe a fever will, yeah. will, will give you when you're, when you're uh, not feeling well. Right. So, and the coronavirus is also this sort of big, huge, ugly monster that's sort of walking the earth and gobbling up countries, and but, but you can't see it at the same time, you know. So we're told to wash our food and wash our clothes and take your shoes off and wash your hands and you know and social distance, and so we're we're constantly battling this thing that is unseeable and. So yes, watching the news and listening to the news seems to be the only way that we make this thing a reality for ourselves. A few weeks ago, I was like, I, I work in essential services. So when I'm over this um, cold, when I'm no longer um, giving off germs, <laughs> spreading germs by coughing or sneezing. And I'm I, sorry, I'll did you say I'm no longer getting off what? I'm sorry. When, when I work in essential services and once I'm over this cold and the germ phase of it, I will be going back to work. Oh, germ phase. Yes, of course. Germ phase, right. And so I, um, I'm a little apprehensive about when a good time for that is. And I've been working my whole life and I've been, my dad worked his whole life and it's kind of a, it's a weird position to be in when you feel like you should be at work. And you're not. And uh, I, I know there's lots of other manifestations of that. People that are waiters or waitresses have lost their incomes completely. So I haven't lost mine and I'm lucky. But staying at home for me causes anxiety because I really feel like I should be at work. And but isn't also going to work, you take the bus um, and, and in terms of your health, you are, how old are you? I'm 60. And what is your health? What are you in the classification of people who are immunocompromised or have risk factors? Yeah, I have uh, I have sixty, so I'm in the in the kind of senior range, and I'm also diabetic, which is in the autoimmune range. Right. And, and when I when I get a fever, I have a hard time uh, managing my blood sugar, uh, and so. Uh, if I go outside today and there's COVID virus floating around nearby, I'll catch it because my immune system is got too much on its plate right now. Right. Uh, so th there's both concerns both ways. I, I, you know, they're telling people to act like they have COVID so they don't spread it. And I'm very conscious about that, but there's also like, I could catch it easily. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. If I haven't already. 
And so you're essential service, but you take the bus to go to work? There's that. There's a mask issue, and I wear gloves, but I don't like masks. I, I, I won't hesitate to wear one, but I don't have one. Yeah, where um, do you know where to get one? No, I don't. I think getting a mask is very hard. I've never actually seen them on sale since this whole thing started. And I missed the envelope of time that allowed you to go out and get hand sanitizer. And so I don't, I don't even have that. So what would you like to get advice from our expert that is on today? I try and be self-sufficient. So, but I also recognize that I'm not, I'm not normal. I'm not near like a breakdown or anything like that, but I am high strung. Unlike my usual self, I'm usually calm and sedate and uh, relaxed. And I'm like (laughs) bouncing around now, kind of uh, part of that stir crazy cabin fever. But I, I feel like I got blinders on about what's going on in the world. So what happens after this? Like there's so much to it, like the the social uh, distancing and the fear that's going to resonate afterwards and not, not saying it's going to end anytime soon, but we're just isolating for extended periods now. And I'm, I don't think humanity's experienced that very often. So we're all going to into isolation mode. It's like solitary confinement. And, and like, I don't think we're equipped to deal with it. Like I, we shouldn't underplay it. Right. It's like, right. I don't know that we're programmed to deal with any of this. It's no, it's we're social heavy. animals. We're social animals. We're, we're, we, we know how to function in and amongst other social beings. And so this is going to be problematic for lots of us. So, okay. So what I'm hearing is anxiety, nightmares, trouble sleeping, and yeah, a no, real I'm, concern I'm, about what's going to happen in the future. Absolutely. The future seems so uncertain. I don't know how to cope with this. I'm, I'm so full of fear. I don't know how to deal with it. I am right. over, I'm over the top and overwhelmed. Right. And that's kind of just a general sense of being out of control. I'm rattled right now. I'm really rattled. I'm not the sort of guy that gets rattled. I was in the, the United States when, when uh, Katrina hit. Um, in New Orleans, and and a month later, Hurricane Rita hit almost a bullseye on Houston proper, mm-hmm. and, and that was a frightening experience of being out of control. I actually left Texas after that because it just seemed so out of control. Like you could wake up the next day and not right. have a bank, and not have a job, and not have a vehicle, and not have any gas, and not have any food, and not have a roof over your head. I mean, it was like Somebody snapped their fingers and life changed on a dime. And that's kind of what this feels like, right? Yeah. And the front lines are not cops anymore. They're, they're healthcare workers and ER nurses and doctors. And they go to work and they're, they're just, they're just, they're in a war zone. And, yeah. and, and it's worse because it's not like, okay, in, in Katrina, a cop goes and, and gets shot. And that, that's just like, tragic he dies from this horrible experience but in this one it's multiplied because a nurse goes home with covid virus and infects her whole family and her family dies i mean everything is is escalated exponentially here um jake thank you so much um you've given us a lot to think about and i i don't suspect i i suspect that you're not alone in that sense of you know low grade to high grade anxiety that we're all dealing with even though we seem to be having a vacation in our homes it's uh you know one would think that we're relaxed but the truth is that there is this low grade anxiety rumbling through our social networks so thank you very much for sharing that with us well you're welcome it's it's like a vacation in a haunted house you know? exactly <laughs> exactly thank you very much okay bernie keep in touch i i wish you well and uh you know good health and uh, be safe thank you Thank you. Okay. You too. We've been talking with Jake and Glenn Grigg about COVID-19 and how it impacts on our anxiety levels. But don't go away. We're going to be right back. 
You're listening to Both Sides Now on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and today I'm here with Glenn Grigg, therapist in private practice and chair of Fact BC, talking about the impact COVID-19 will have on our mental health. Glenn, we got to listen to Jake talk about his situation. How do you, would you respond to him? The first thing I want to share is my gratitude to Jake for being so articulate about the lived experience of of being in a a pandemic. And uh, Jake's situation is is one for us to really pay attention to uh, because Jake described that uh, he has just one friend that he sees and that he's been isolated for a long time. And uh, what I mean is uh, that he's not in solitary confinement. He has television and so on but he's making sporadic contact with only one person. And that's a very, very yes, lean psychological diet. Yes, it is. And it's odd, right? With. Like most of us, or even Jake talked about there, about going to work, that work was an important part of his daily activities. And because he was sick, he hasn't been to work. And um, that's really impacted on him. So the anxiety he's feeling and then how he described it about, you know, this bouncing on the inside of his being, um, what would you suggest to people that that they do to deal with that anxiety? How how would you help them uh, mitigate that? Well, there's a couple of things that uh, I want to talk about some general things eventually, but I want to get back to some of the mm-hmm. uh, particular things that uh, Jake can do. And uh, these things, uh, when you know, when Jake uh, started to uh, be on his own, which is months ago, uh, some of these resources were not available. But one of the questions that Jake was asking was, do I have a bad cold or am I really tolerating COVID-19 right. very well? That's a tough call to make. However, and I'm, I'm not going to anticipate uh, what the health professionals are saying, they can really do some uh, good interviewing and rule out what's going on. So for people who identify with Jake wondering, I've got a cough, I've got a runny nose, uh, I'm, I've got some kind of respiratory trouble, what should you do? The answer is that there's a telehealth line that you can call. It's 811. Mm-hmm. So call 811 uh, I've had multiple experiences with this service. They're so fantastic. let me stop you there. So and this your is, experience of 811 has been fantastic. When did you call them? At what time frame? Because I, I will tell you that people who have tried to call 811 that I know can't get through. Okay. I've had a couple of clients who were exactly in the situation uh, where they said, you know, I, I'm worried sick. I don't know if I have COVID-19 or a bad cold right. or some other kind of flu. I need to resolve that. So uh, the story was uh, at least a couple of times. One was 45 minutes mm-hmm. waiting to get through. Another was an hour and 10 minutes getting through on 811. So there's no doubt about it. At least my experience has been uh, that there's a wait. However, uh, in the people I've talked to said the wait time was worth it if you can put in that wait time. Okay, uh, so the they were they able to call and actually get some clear understanding of whether the symptoms they have are COVID-19 or not? They're able to do some screening. And so there are, are certain kinds of symptoms. Uh, I don't want to uh, you know, be that kind of doctor for anybody, of course. Uh, but there are uh, okay. symptom checklists that they can walk you through. And then they have uh, a range of options. One is they can reassure you you don't have it. The other is uh, that they can arrange for you to be seen or tested or uh, called back uh, 
by somebody uh, with even more medical expertise uh, than the person on the line. That sounds uh, great. I, I have also not... heard of a lot of people who are very sick and they're being told that, yes, you probably have COVID-19, but we can't test you. Just go home and take care of yourself. And if you get to the point of not being able to breathe, then you can go to the hospital and then we might test you. So I think part of what what um, Jake is talking about and a part of what is creating that anxiety is not knowing and not having a really clear way of finding out whether you do or don't. For myself, I keep using my chronic fatigue as an example, but chronic fatigue has a lot of physical um, manifestations like a yes. sore throat, um, headaches, I have asthma, so sometimes yeah. if my neighbor is smoking, I can't breathe properly. Um, I also have allergies, so I sneeze constantly and my nose runs. If I was to follow the COVID um, criteria of when you self-isolate it, I would never leave my house. So yeah. that's part of the anxiety and, that Jake is talking about is that we don't, you know, it's not just an unseen, invisible enemy. It's no way of knowing whether it's in your house. That's right. Yeah, you don't have those yeah. kinds of indications. And, and as you've been saying, one of the things uh, we were all very likely here uh, from health authorities is when you call up, Sometimes they can't say, well, you know, it's not uh, COVID-19, but they can say, given what I'm hearing, there's a strong possibility. And the idea is that you then self-monitor. And if it gets worse, uh, you yeah. have a pathway uh, to help and uh, a criterion by which you take the next step. That might not be satisfactory uh, in the sense that you'd like to hear something pretty definitive right now. But what I want to do is go to the psychology of that that if I'm sitting in total mystery, my thoughts are just spinning in my head. Uh, my emotional arousal in a really negative way is spiraling upward and upward and upward. Jake described this perfectly. You cannot sit still. You're just moving all the time. There's nothing you can mm -hmm. do to resolve that. And so to get some information that says, okay, uh, if these symptoms get worse or if they change to this other cluster of symptoms, Here's who I call, and this is what they'll well, do. We will make that can sure make a huge Jake difference. knows about 811. Yeah. Um, we okay. actually have some resources that we are going to put on in terms of um, good, solid resources that you can use to get facts. And of course, people have their own choices about news sources, but these are um, sort of factual scientific websites that will talk about the facts of COVID. We need to just take a little break, but don't go away. We'll be right back with Glenn talking about COVID-19 and how it's impacting on our mental health. You're listening to Both Sides Now on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, here with my co-host, therapist Glenn Grigg, talking about COVID-19 on our mental health. Great to health. be here. We had a chance to hear Jake talk about anxiety, but I had another chance to talk with a friend of mine, Steve, about how his lifelong experience of depression is being impacted by COVID-19. Hi, Steve. Hi, Bernie. How long have you lived with depression? Um, basically, all of my life. It probably started when I was, I don't know, six or seven. That's a long time. Not that I'm yeah. calling you old, but it's, old. it's like throughout all of your childhood and adult life. Yes. Yes. So when COVID-19 impacted on the Pacific Northwest here and we went into social isolation or distancing, whatever you want to call it, um, you began to notice something. How long did it take you to notice? Well, it, it kind of came in stages. Um, I expected depression because this is a depressing situation. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, it didn't surprise me that I would be depressed. But what concerned me, what got me worried was how deep my depression went. Mm. And when I started having suicidal thoughts, um, I thought, uh oh, this is getting deep. Time to, you know, do something about this. Right. So, how long was it from the start of our social isolation to getting suicidal thoughts? No, it wasn't until about three, four days ago. Okay. That oh. The suicidal thoughts started happening. So, a week and a half or more. Oh, I've, I had been isolating since way back in January when I first heard about this. I oh. had a good understanding of what was going on. I've been expecting um, some form of pandemic to happen it, It's for a long time. Uh, I look at it as a function of our population, mm -hmm. of our overpopulation. And it did not surprise me that it happened. It was just, oh, here it is. Better start uh, taking care of myself. So, so you were well prepared, well in advance. So uh, the rest of us, it would have been a week and a half. But for you, it was more like two and a half months. Yes. Yes. So in that social isolation, did you go out of the house or did you see friends or did you stop any of that stuff way back in January? I limited um, how often I was going out of a house. Right. And it's just my nature to be a hermit anyways. So I decided, okay, I'm going to limit myself to actually having physical contact with one friend. Right. So you've seen one friend for a long time. Yes. Uh, okay. So you started to recognize that you were becoming suicidal? A suicidal thought flashed through my mind. Mm. And it's been well over a decade since that has happened right and uh, that was kind of like okay you're figuring you get depressed but you weren't figuring on this deep of a depression so mm -hmm. time to start you know paying serious attention to the depression right and deal with it and wh what did you do but how, how do you deal it when you get that depressed first uh, well first thing is recognizing it that's mm -hmm. one of the uh, tricky things about depression. Oftentimes, you can be really depressed and not aware that you're depressed. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing was, yeah, just kind of like sitting up and saying, oh, right, I'm depressed. And it's time to do something. Um, one of the first things I did was call a friend and just talk to them. I didn't tell them I was depressed or anything, but it just I reached out and to a friend that I know it's safe to reach out to. I just had a, a long talk with her for oh about an hour. This is thing, is this the same person that you consider your contact person in this time? No. Okay. This is uh, another friend that um when I say no contact, I mean no physical contact. Right, right. You know, but I reached out to her on the telephone, and I talked to her for a while. And then I got the friend that I have physical contact with, got together with him, and went grocery shopping and bought a bunch of, uh, bunch of food, a bunch of comfort food, ice cream, cookies, chocolate, and like that. Made sure I was well stocked up, so I was comfortable that okay, I've got food for ah week and a half, two weeks, so you know I didn't have to worry about that. And did and, your friend that you went shopping with know that you were that depressed? No, no. no. Did you tell anybody that you were that depressed? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. So you handled this by doing what you needed to do, which was reach out to friends 
and yeah. have contact and social interactions. Yes. So yeah. what else are you doing to put in place to make sure that you stay safe in this time? I'm, I'm being kind to myself. I have a bad habit of beating myself up over not doing things. I've mm. got quite a big agenda of things that I want to do. And it's easy for me to start beating myself up. Oh, you haven't done anything today or, you know, you didn't get that done or you didn't get this done. But I've given myself permission to not do anything. Just being mm -hmm. kind to myself. And I've, I've just said, no, it's strange times we're going through here. You don't have to, you know, get anything done. Right. Eat, you know, sleep. And uh, it's all good after that. That's good. Way to go. <laughs> I think we all need to be kind to ourselves and, you know, just recognize that none of us have done this before. This is all oh. new. And um, we're bound to come up against things that we don't really necessarily have coping skills around. Not that that's you, because clearly you know what to do when you're depressed and how to take care of it. Well, I've, I've done many years of therapy, so, um, yeah, my, my journey with depression has uh, been long, strange, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, I've, I've uh, picked up quite a toolkit for dealing with it. I think the trickiest part was just learning how to recognize that I'm depressed. What are the symptoms of depression coming from somebody who has lived with depression? Um, there's quite a few, and I think they differ, differ for everybody. But for me, um, one of, I think one of the first symptoms is that I get very negative. Mm -hmm. um, everything is wrong. You right. know, everybody's stupid and everything is wrong. <laughs> and, you know. When I when I first catch myself doing that, I say, okay, yeah, I know what this is. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody is not wrong. This is me thinking everybody's wrong, and that's because I'm in a bad mood. Right. So you not only do the sort of bad self talk of being punishing towards yourself, but you you do that with other people outside of yourself as well. I don't necessarily tell them, but it's no. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And what are some of the other symptoms that people might um, recognize in themselves as being depression? I get tired a lot. Mm. I just don't sleep. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, when it gets really bad, I mean, uh, clinical depression is you just can't get out of bed. Right. You know, I, I've learned to promise myself a treat. You know, if you get up, you can do this. Right. <laughs> you know, um, I'm a smoker. I'm a heavy smoker. So I, I, I use that to get myself out of bed. I, I tell myself, well, you can have the cigarette when you get up. Right. You know, and that will kind of draw me up, uh, at least to get up and moving. Mm-hmm. And it's not probably surprising that nicotine triggers dopamine in your brain to actually make you feel better. So it's kind of like self-medicating your depression. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Oh, it is. I used yeah. to smoke three packs a day and uh, had to create my own program to quit smoking and then a part of that is i did a lot of research about what happens in your brain and nicotine is very addictive because you have that puff it triggers your brain to release dopamine and you have an immediate feeling of being much better much happier much so yeah and if, of course if you don't have that nicotine hit then you don't feel good, you feel bad, and 
and and and so yeah. Yeah. yeah well thank you steve for sharing that story and stay safe out there i think probably more than most you know what we're dealing with and um have been well prepared way to go thank you you're welcome and you stay safe also bernie i will i will absolutely Glenn, how common is it that depression is being triggered off in folks who've never had it or in those who have a lifelong experience of it? The, uh, the probability that uh, depression is going to come in some form for many, many, many of us is extremely high under these circumstances because depression is often uh, a response to loss. And when we think about what's happening in COVID-19, we're losing connections with other people. And as uh, we heard, not just from uh, uh, Steve, but also from Jake, sometimes when you can't go to work, you've also lost your identity and you've lost a lot of the ways you get your social needs met. So uh, this is very expectable. And one of the things that I want to emphasize about making it expectable is to not downplay its seriousness and to not downplay uh, how difficult it is to cope with. Uh, but... Uh, one of the things that uh, Steve mentioned was that uh, he said, you know, I've got an inner critic or, you know, a part of me that I can really beat myself up. Uh, if you're sort of forewarned and forearmed that uh, depression just kind of goes with these circumstances, you tend to be kinder to yourself about what you're going through. So I think that's an important place to start. I also think that it's like, unlike Steve, who knows what his depression is. He knows the parameters. He knows what it looks like. He knows when the danger red flag comes up and says, hey, deal with this. Um, there are going to be a lot of people who are sitting in their homes and they are isolated and they are going to be you know, ex experiencing some level of depression. May not be clinical depression like Steve or s some other folks. But what should they be looking for in terms of how does depression start to manifest and what does it look like? Yeah, it, it's going to come on slowly. And what I would encourage people to be watching for uh, is that kind of transition uh, where you're starting to get almost kind of annoyed with yourself uh, because uh, you sat down in that chair and half an hour later, uh, you haven't got up and you just sat down for five minutes. So one of the things you'll notice is that motivation is really, really hard to find. Right. And uh, you'll notice in your thought process uh, that you're having the same thought over and over and over again. Like what uh, kind of the, thought? Sorry, what kind of thought? Uh, it can be uh, thoughts have two kind of qualities that are kind of subtle when uh, uh, depression is kind of making its way into your process. One is that they're often pretty reasonable thoughts, but they're just a little bit distorted. So it could say, uh, normal thought might be, you know, I feel a little bit tired today. A depression thought would be, I feel extremely tired today, and I think I'll never have any energy again. Hmm. That, that thought is sort of a reasonable thought to have, but it's also distorted because you will have some energy again, and it's very, very negative. And so this is another sign when you see uh, motivation going away, thinking is either a little or maybe even a lot uh, distorted and negative. And what you'll also experience when you're doing things uh, is that what used to take you half an hour might take you all day to get done. Right. What used to feel kind of rewarding when you do it, now it feels exhausting when you do it. And what used to feel difficult is now just absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. That's how you, those are some of the indicators uh, that uh, you're experiencing some depression. I think also that that goes along with this is that we are all doing something that we've actually never done before and living through something that nobody in our immediate life has dealt with before. 1918 was a long time ago. And while there might be some 
people who are still alive from then. Most of us don't know those folks. So, so we're doing something that's brand new. We've never done it. We don't have any coping skills for it that we've developed over our lifetime. And if you're suddenly dealing with depression on top of that and it comes on subtly, we may not be recognizing it and may not have our usual regular things that reflect back to us about how we're doing now in our lives because we're isolated in our homes. So is there something that people can put in place to be that reflection or... Um, because, I mean, certainly they can just kind of slide into something relatively easy, I would think. And, uh, Bernadine, from my point of view, you're on to something absolutely essential about what we need to do for ourselves, what we need to do for each other, because we're in a novel situation. Uh, it's, it's, un- uh, we've been using this word unprecedented and it really, it, it does have some precedent, but not for a hundred years. It was a hundred years since our community went through anything that's comparable to this. And so what we're, um, what happens when, especially when there's depression around and just uh, any kind of problems with mood, if we wanted to make that worse, if we wanted to really feed that, what we would do is we would amplify a sense of powerlessness and helplessness. But fortunately, the opposite of that can be very, very effective. And you can do an experiment with yourself. When you listen to the news, you say, oh, that's terrible news. Do something that's very active and very positive. It doesn't have to be big and it doesn't have to take long. But you say, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to go wash my hands. I'm going to go look up a list of friends who might be isolated. And I'm going to make a supportive phone call. But one of the most important things we can do uh, when there's very understandable vulnerability to depression and the experience of depression uh, is get active, get doing something that you have some power to accomplish and that you have some control over. Uh, That's almost the polar opposite of depression. And it is hard to get it going. But once you're rolling, it really makes a difference. So do something to give yourself some sense of power and control. Is that what yeah. you're meaning? That's something that you're going to do. And I, I know uh, one of the things that's been kind of interesting in the uh, uh, grocery stores, I was inquiring of a, a local manager because they, uh, they seem to have no baking supplies on the shelves. They said they're just flying off the shelves because mm-hmm. people are doing things. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're making some baking. And, you know, you can... Uh, you know, it's something you can do for your family. It's something useful you can do. And uh, as Steve pointed out, he said, you know, I bought a bunch of comfort food and it made a huge difference. He's being a good friend to himself. Uh, And uh, over and over again, I thought he did a brilliant job of identifying that it's the relationship that you have with yourself that's also going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so under these circumstances, uh, don't expect yourself to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Getting through the day is a big deal and congratulate yourself for that. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be kind to ourselves. I live on the uh, base of a mountain. It has a lot of trails. And one of the things that the community has been doing, and certainly the children in the community, is that they've created a scavenger hunt. And so the kids and people are using rocks to paint and so they paint them and they put little designs on them and then they they leave them about on the trails and create scavenger hunts for kids it's actually a a beautiful thing to do uh, to probably mitigate some of that depression that we're all feeling a little bit anyway so you're out there doing something Uh, Mm -hmm. you're getting uh, something accomplished and you know, isn't it great that, you know, the creative challenge is, you know, what can I do even though it's kind of social, but also keeps us two meters apart in a reliable way.
All right. So um, thank you, Glenn, for chatting with us. And I look forward to having another conversation with you next week um, to go over a few more of these issues. It's been a pleasure to be here. Okay. So that was Glenn, one of our co-hosts here on Both Sides Now, who's also the chair of BAC BC, a therapist in private practice, and somebody who's helping to build a response, a mental health response to COVID-19 here in the province of BC. And we'll be right back, so don't go away. You're listening to Both Sides Now on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox. COVID-19 has blasted our worlds apart. In one day, our lives went from a regular schedule to stocking our shelves, losing our gigs, being laid off, closing our businesses, and reframing how we do certain things like a radio program out of your home and connecting with folks via distance instead of at the radio station itself. We are disconnected from people who keep us grounded. I haven't been able to hug some of my grandkids in a while. And while technology is also saving us, for some who are older, it's just a curse that they're unable to navigate and cannot get someone in to help them. We watch the news with horror, and if you're like me, you look out onto a normal world that basks in the sunshine and seems unaffected until you hit a grocery store with lines of people waiting outside with masks on, and you can't buy common household items like toilet paper or maxi pads or pasta or baking yeast, and we hear of meat processing plants closing down. The disconnected is disconcerting and jolting. Both Sides Now is committed to helping folks through COVID-19 as best as we can, not just with our programming each week, but with resources on our website, www.bothsidesnowbc.com slash resources. That's bothsidesnowbc.com slash resources. You can also head over to the podcast section where you will find our podcast listed going back through the last year, but we will also be posting hot topic segments as they're done. If there is something that you are dealing with that you want us to address, don't hesitate to contact me, Bernadine Fox, by using the contact form on the website or by emailing bothsidesnowbc at outlook.com. That's bothsidesnowbc at outlook.com. I will find someone to address that particular topic personally for you. My thanks to Glenn Grigg for responding to folks today and to Steve for his long distance operating of our sound and also to Sherry Alrick whose song It's All Right has been our theme song for a year now. If you have questions or feedback about this program or want to share your story or have something to say to us, we want to hear from you. You can reach us by email both sides now at coopradio.org we're via Twitter at Both Sides Now BC. This is Bernadine Fox. We'll be back next week. Until then. I can't seem to find my way under or over or through. Just when I'm ready to give up the fight, there you are when we turn out the lights. And it's all right. It's all right. in